Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Uh, so when I was a mission developer up in New Jersey in the early 2000s, I was tasked with building a new church from the ground up, a, a multicultural church that we called Bridge of Peace Community Church that to this day includes people of various backgrounds and ethnicity, and they worship in three languages, English and Spanish and Portuguese. Now, you need to know that the the approach to mission development, to church planting at that time, was for the pastor to go door to door, this is before the internet, right, to visit every home in the neighborhood, to introduce themselves, and to invite people one by one to come check out the new church. So for the first two years or so, I did little else but pounding the sidewalk, <laughs> up one side and down the other, knocking on every door, 6,000 of them, if you must know. And so one day when I was out in the neighborhood doing this, I noticed, I noticed the people, piece of paper on the sidewalk. It was a torn envelope, actually, which a concerned mother had used to scribble a note to her kids. Behave! the note said, with three exclamation points for emphasis. Behave, I'll be right back. Don't fight, please. Love, mom. Well, I know you will think me quite the nerd, but I actually kept that envelope. <laughs> As a kind of a memento, and I have it to this day, more than 20 years later, which is why I can show you a picture of that mother's note. I came across that note the other day as I was cleaning out my office. After seven years as your pastor here at Christ the King Lutheran Church. And today is my last Sunday with you. And so I feel like I want to leave a note with you. A note that says, behave yourselves. <laughs> Just like that worried mother did all these many years ago. Behave yourselves. Don't fight. Love, Pastor Wolfgang. Well, in the New Testament letter that we call Second Peter, the author does a similar thing, offering some final instructions, some final words, some affirmations as he prepares to depart. In the opening verses, this epistle claims to be written by Simon Peter, you know, that very important character in the whole New Testament. If that were true, we could date the letter to the 60s in the first century because Peter was martyred in Rome around the year 68. And in the letter, he says himself, he's writing because he knows that death is near, that's right around the corner, that the end is coming. Of course, biblical scholars have debated for some time now whether Peter actually is the author. They think it's more likely that one of Peter's disciples wrote the letter some years after Peter's death. You know, that was quite common at the time for followers of holy men to write manuscripts in their name. The technical term for that is pseudo-epigraphical, but you don't have to remain. Only theology nerds like me need to know that word. You don't. But what I do want you to remember is that in this letter, Peter, if he is the author, leaves some final words with his followers. He knows he's going to die soon, so he's really writing, you know, his last testament, so to speak. Last words of concern, of appreciation, of encouragement, of gratitude. Now, to be clear, I have no plans to die anytime soon, and I sure hope God doesn't either. But I do feel like I should leave some last words for you to ponder, some last words of love and encouragement and gratitude. Here are two of the first photos I took during my very first visit to CTK back in the summer of 2016. The call committee had invited me to come to Cary to meet with them, to, you know, be formally interviewed, to see the place. Now, the work of a call committee, as you know, is confidential until they are ready to present a candidate to the church council and to the congregation. So to be sure we wouldn't run into anybody during our tour, 
I got the tour of the campus in the middle of the night. You know, it's really hard to find a time when there's nothing going on in this building because there's always something going on. <clears throat> now, you know, I, you all know I take lots of pictures. Anyone who is my Facebook friend knows this. In fact, my phone says that to date I have taken 9,869 pictures in my time here. Maybe I'll take a few more today, but I doubt I'll get to 10,000. Here you see the outside of the atrium that night all lit up. And, and that, by the way, is the sanctuary, the way it looked before the renovations that we undertook a year later. But what impressed me the most, what delighted me the most, was what I saw when they showed me the high school youth room downstairs. This is what was written on the whiteboard there. The kids obviously had summarized their admittedly short life experiences into a succinct statement. Life is crazy, but God is good. I was, I was delighted to see this work of unknown young artists. And you know, the truth is, this statement could summarize everything I've been trying to tell you in almost 300 sermons, untold Bible studies, and something like 3,000 meetings over seven years. Life is crazy, but God is good. The notion of God's goodness and mercy in the midst of a chaotic and crazy world is most important in this letter that we call Second Peter. And it's most important to us, especially as we find ourselves once again in a season of change and transition. The Christian claim is that by God's divine power, God has given to us everything we need for a meaningful and purpose-driven life that reflects God's love in all we do and all we say. That's how Second Peter puts it. Life may be crazy, challenging, exhausting, downright desperate at times, but God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And all the time, the letter of Second Peter says it this way. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with excellence and excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. Excellence, knowledge, self-control. Endurance, godliness, mutual affection, love, those are the gifts of God that you and I have shared together over these past few years. And now as we move into a new season of ministry here at CTK under the leadership of your new senior pastor, Pastor Daniel, I urge you to remember these divine promises. I want to say to you at this moment of departure, Remember God's promises. Double down on your faith. Keep on going. Life is crazy, but God is good. And truth be told, God has given you everything you need to thrive. A whole lot of dedicated disciples at this church who are ready to go to work. Say amen if you agree. A spruced up campus with brand new solar panels right over our head. Amen. Amen. A robust faith formation program second to none. Amen. Amen. A well-regarded preschool. Amen. Amen. A reputation as a radically welcoming church that isn't afraid to engage with and in the community. Amen. An outstanding and committed staff team. Amen. Including including a new senior pastor who is passionate about the faith, experienced in ministry, visionary and knowledgeable, able and eager to lead you into the next chapter. As Christ, amen, as Christ the King Lutheran Church in its 60th year looks forward with confidence to a bright future. Say amen and give Pastor Daniel and his team a round of applause.
see, it's, it's all there. You have all the pieces. All you got to do is keep on going and doing the important ministry you've been doing all along, using the tremendous gifts that God has put at your disposal. See, today isn't just my last Sunday with you. It isn't just Super Bowl Sunday either. Today, most importantly, is Transfiguration Sunday in the church. Transfiguration Sunday. A day of, a day of transition, a gateway, so to speak, from one season of the year to another, a door from the season of Epiphany to the season of Lent, which of course begins this week with Ash Wednesday. I think it's an appropriate day to celebrate together the new season of ministry that CTK is about to enter. It's also a day of revelation because on this day, in this story in Mark's gospel, we get a glimpse of the transfigured Jesus, of the changed Jesus, the Jesus who appears before his disciples in a, in a dazzling light, a glimpse of the divine Jesus who finally drops the mask and shows himself for who he really is. The gentle Jesus that unassuming country preacher from Galilee, the carpenter's son, whom everyone in town knows as Mary's boy, that Jesus goes up on a mountain. And there on that mountain, he goes up there to pray with Peter and James and John. He goes up to pray and up there on that mountain in front of Peter and John and James, that regular guy Jesus goes through an amazing change. He is transfigured, transformed, changed. Jesus is shown for who he really is. And so today on this Transfiguration Sunday, we recommit ourselves to this Jesus and to Jesus' story and to telling about God's unconditional love in Jesus Christ to all those around us, seeking transformation for ourselves and for our community. We celebrate a new beginning and a renewed sense of mission. And we celebrate the transfiguration, not just of Jesus on that mountaintop long ago, but the transfiguration, the transformation that Jesus has in store for you and for me and for Christ the King Lutheran Church. It's a powerful word, that word, transfiguration. Almost reminds me of these TV characters that my son Kai liked to watch when he was a kid. They were called the Mighty Morphin Power Ray. Do you remember those? Are they still on? They must be in syndication someplace. <laughs> they were called the Power Rangers because they could transform themselves from, from regular nerdy teenagers, from California no less, into those lean, mean fighting machines that could take any foe however evil, and fight them. They could morph. They took that from this fancy word metamorphosis, which just means change. They could morph just as Superman morphs from a regular guy newspaper reporter into the man of steel. Just as mild-mannered and super-rich Bruce Wayne morphs into Batman as soon as a crime is being committed in Gotham City. Just as Jesus morphs from a humble country preacher to a dazzling apparition up there on the mountain. There is power in transformation, power in transfiguration, Holy Spirit power that is available to us too. Are you with me on this? Yeah. Because we too are transformed. We too are transformed when Jesus invites us into a life of discipleship. We too get to drop our masks and stop pretending. We too get to be our true selves, our authentic selves, as beloved children of God, made in God's image. Whatever the world may say or think about you, whatever shortcomings you may see in yourself, know this, you are created in God's image and God loves you just, just as you are, words and all. Say yes if you believe God loves you. Okay, and now say it as if you mean it with three exclamation points behind it. Yes. yes! Daniel Schultz of the Wisconsin Council of Churches Health Program writes in this month's edition of the Christian Century, 
Like the post-resurrection stories, it anticipates that transfiguration is a reality that can be seen and felt and touched and tasted, even if only for a moment. So, beloved, claim that power. Live into that reality of transformation. Transform more and more into the beloved people of God that you are. Underneath all the cares and scares of the crazy world, remember, the world is crazy, but God loves you. And that, beloved of God, is the good news for you this morning. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Oh, one more thing. Behave. Don't fight. <laughs>